So welcome everyone. Thank you for coming to the last session of, of the workshop day. Um, so I'm gonna do my best to keep this interesting for, for everyone. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the presentation is really flexible. I didn't know what level of expertise I was going to have uh, coming into this. So I'll probably start off by asking some questions to get a feel for how to, how to target uh, the presentation. So I guess, uh, guess we'll, we'll kind of get started. Um, oh, for full disclosure, I do have two video cameras going. Uh, they're, up, they're pointed toward the front and toward me. Uh, I'm going to do my best to remember to repeat questions uh, for, the, for the recording, but I might forget that, but uh, all of you will most likely not be heard or, or seen in the presentation. So um, yeah, let's get started. Uh, I'm Chris Chrysostom, and the person who helped me write this presentation is Trent Larson. He's not here right now, um, but uh, uh, so I left it to me to, to kind of go through uh, this business of building a blockchain register. And I don't know if you can read the, the low, smaller letters there, but using open source software. And that's kind of what the key is about how to do this. I, I want it uh, to give everyone an opportunity to see what it's like to do it yourself if you really want it to. And I'm going to show some demonstra demo, demo apps uh, during this presentation. And it's just kind of show you how uh, well, if you're a developer, how easy it is to uh, put this together. And if you're not a developer, maybe uh, it will give you an idea of, of if, you, if you knew someone who was uh, expertise enough in building applications, that they, they too would be able to build uh, something simple quickly to give you an idea of what it would be like to record uh, property records on, on blockchain. So, um, uh, I, this is me. I've been developing software for way too long. <laughs> uh, and I think uh, I just simply say I started in the 80s. Probably what's important about blockchain related development uh, is I was introduced to Bitcoin in 2012 and then actively got started in developing decentralized Bitcoin uh, applications in 2015. And one of the first things I did was I kind of played around with the idea of recording a bill of sale a record, a receipt on blockchain so everyone could see it. So uh, that's kind of where I got started. Uh, the majority of my blockchain development work actually was more in the entertainment industry and uh, the problem that was being solved or work being worked on by a project called the Decentralized Library of Alexandria was that they wanted to decentralize uh, the content that was produced by artists in such a way that uh, they could kind of avoid uh, I guess the middleman of YouTube, or uh, Apple, Microsoft, Spotify, that type of thing. So that's what that was. Uh, and then I came to Medici Ventures about a year and a half ago. Medici Ventures is actually, uh, I would probably say it's a, what do we call it, a, an incubator for blockchain related startups. There's about 20 portfolio companies and Medici land governance is one of them and I was assigned to work on Medici land governance and so that's kind of where that uh, comes from. So this was fascinating and all of you in the room this is one thing I, I, I guess I probably don't need to talk about but, but uh, I was doing some research and of course uh, Hurricane Maria hitting Puerto Rico was quite devastating but what was even more devastating to me afterwards is to find out that it was very difficult for people who live in the United States to prove their ownership so they can get FEMA funds, so they could do their reconstruction. Um, and from what I understand, there were actually a couple of sessions, I think, that actually talked about this issue at length uh, during this conference, and I really appreciated it. But I have to admit, it kind of made an impact on me to think, wow, that this is this is an issue. Proving, proving ownership is a big deal. And, you know, and this, this is happening right here in the United States. So anyway, um, yeah, interesting numbers though. Uh, so 40% of applications were approved, 60% were denied. And again, the majority of those were simply, there was, there was no mechanism for proving <coughs> ownership. Although FEMA did start to ratchet down some of their requirements. Uh, from what I understood, they actually made it possible for someone to sign their own affidavit saying that they lived in a 
property for a length of time. So this, this had an impact on me for what I'm going to show because I was thinking, okay, how do, how do we build uh, applications to fix that? And then, of course, uh, I'm of the age where this 1992 to 1995, I actually was in college. It actually, uh, actually it was right after college for me, and this kind of had a big impact on me in that we, we saw this unfold on TV uh, every day. And what I found interesting, though, is years later, when they start talking about uh, repa repatriation or people coming back, uh, th there is also an issue of uh, ownership. So in this report, it actually was talking about how they were trying to resolve, you know, bringing people back into, uh, into Bosnia. And, and they wrote, um, defining improving ownership or right of use is not easy in countries such as, and they used Afghanistan and Iraq as examples, where property grabs have become the norm and where the nature of property ownership and other rights relating to land and housing may be <coughs> arbitrary. So uh, I just, you know, again, uh, because I was, I was a young man when all this was going on, this actually was, uh, in, you know, something that kind of stuck with me for a long time. So when I saw this information and start making me think again, wow, okay, being able to prove uh, your uh, property rights is a significant thing in the world. So, this kind of led me to this uh, issue about, uh, um, you know, what are the problems in, with, with property records right now? So, um, I know there's probably, there, there's a lot, but the two that kind of struck me as, as interesting uh, for uh, what I'm going to walk through today is uh, the issues surrounding paper-based property records and informal property records. And with paper-based property records, even when you're really, really organized, um, it, uh, the, what happens is that, that those paper-based re records are accessible only by people who are local to where uh, that paper-based system is. So as an example, um, uh, we, we actually have, uh, uh, MLG actually has a, uh, an MOU with the, a county in the state of Wyoming. It's given me an opportunity to uh, talk to uh, county clerks. And I discovered that even the small ones <laughs> that are actually still at 0% digitization, um, the mechanism for finding property records, ownership, the warranty deeds, mortgages, releases, and all that, um, some unlucky soul actually has to travel to the county and go into their office and go through their paper records to find things. So it's quite localized. And again, I'm talking about the United States here for, for something like that. So it, it's an issue. However, there are other problems too. I mean, there's data degradation. Interesting idea. Uh, whenever calamity strikes that said office that I talked about, um, there is kind of a risk that the, the data, the information there could get ruined or, 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 or disappear, it actually, it just, it just could go away. Um, and I talked a little bit about how paper-based records are kind of a bit inefficient, you know, again, uh, in, in the case of the United States, about 3,300 uh, county recorders, so there, uh, before digitization, there was 3,300 different ways or offices that one would have to travel to if they were going to try to do a, like a nation, nationwide search uh, on, on property. Um, and then the second issue, informal property records, something that struck me about that is, uh, you know, I kind of uh, learned that, uh, and I've seen this number thrown around at this conference, that 75% of of the world doesn't have access to formal property records, so they get frequently they get excluded from um, well, f from the financial systems that are available in, in the world, uh, among other things. So when I talk about informal property records, so uh, what we've discovered is that people do make agreements with each other to make decisions about how they're going to use property. Uh, so some of the issues that we find with that, of course, the media that that's recorded on, it's really variable. Uh, it could be uh, ink on paper, that'll be pretty handy, and then someone, some unlucky soul has to copy that multiple times so all parties within an agreement can, can see, um, you know, have an opportunity to see that and they can reference it at a later time. 
But, you know, uh, as I recently learned, um, uh, media could also be in people's memories, so oral histories, as you're just trying to, uh, everyone just remembers that a certain uh, plot of land has been in the family for 200 years or something. And, and of course, I'm sure there ends up to be debates of, as to what they mean by in the family for 200 years, but the point is, is uh, that that's information that's recorded in people's memory and passed down uh, from one individual to another. So. Um, and again, we have some issues of it being locally accessible. Uh, it's even, uh, you know, could actually be less efficient than paper-based rec records, because in paper-based records, and especially if I, I was using uh, these rural counties in Wyoming as one example, I mean, they do have a filing system. So it is, you do have an index that you can go to to, to research things. Um, most of the time, records are abstracted out so that searching is made easier, even if it's on paper. But in formal property records, we don't know. We just don't know if that's going to be possible. So we get to the crux of what this workshop is going to be about. So I, uh, I'm about to cross over to the point where uh, I'm going to ask for a little more interaction and be sure I want to make all of you know or understand that I welcome questions. Uh, as you can hear, I have a tendency sometimes to talk fast when I'm uh, excited about a particular topic. So feel free to wave your hands, slow me down, and ask a question because uh, I did intend uh, this to be kind of a workshop. I actually did have some code available for people to look at if, if there were developers in the room, but um, I'm guessing that uh, I'm going to skip over some of, some of that stuff and maybe or talk about it in more generalized terms for everyone to, uh, to look at. But again, I'm hoping that we can have more of a conversation going forward. So here's a question that, as a technologist, that I start to face when I start looking at these issues. So how do we, and I mean like all of us, how, how does everyone in the world, how do we build a register application to make those records durable, transparent, censorship resistant, and globally accessible? Um, so I kind of translated it to this technical problem. And it all looks, sounds almost the same as what I just said because, you know, we do want it, the technology to try to match up with the real world problems that we have. But again, really, when it comes down to, uh, in terms of technology, I want sustainable persistence of public records. Now, let me, let me break that down a little bit. Um, when, I say, uh, when I talk about public records, Right now, I am, I am literally meaning information that, that people or organizations deem important enough that they want to record and they do want everyone to see it. In the case of property rights, uh, the, the thinking is, uh, yeah, if I, I am an owner of some property, I actually do want everyone to know about it because I don't want anyone else to conflict with my claim to, to that property. So I, am, I'm gonna, I want that to be public. Uh, sustainable persistence. That's an interesting way for me to phrase this. But what I mean by sustainable persistence, and I actually did hear this talked about here at this conference, is uh, we, we, I want a system that will allow the data that I put into some sort of public space to stay there for, well, I would hope forever, but at least stay there in a way that um, it will continue to stay there. So when I mean sustainable, that means in the real world when someone has to expend resources to run computers, to put your data on, you know, you, you, if you have hard disks or even solid state drives, everything takes electricity, so someone has to pay an electricity bill. Sustainable means how do we uh, you know, create a system where all those things get paid for on a regular basis so that they will, so that data that I put into this public space uh, will, be, will be used. Anyway, and again, uh, these four uh, themes here, you'll probably hear me say this frequently, and the people who uh, listen to a lot of blockchain related speakers are probably hear these four things a lot. But I'm going to repeat it here for you because they do have technical consequences that we need to keep in mind. Um, so what this translates to is we need data to be transparent, 
censorship resistant, globally accessible, and secure. And that is where I'm willing to entertain any questions to, to clarify any of that. So I'm going to say this again. So what we want to do is we want to build a register where the data is transparent. And that, that means everyone can see it and everyone can have knowledge about how it was written, and who wrote it, and when it was written. So, um, you know, when we can see all those things, we have full transparency. Censorship resistant. So what I mean by that is once I write something to this public record, it stays there. It's immutable, doesn't go away. So, uh, and I do say censorship resistant, I kind of hedge a little bit on the terminology there because in reality, especially in, in computer stuff, um, it's very difficult. It's, you, one never should say never. So I, I can't say that things will never get hacked or, uh, or an encryption algorithm will never get uh, figured out and decrypt it really fast, whatever. But censorship resistant means that you've built a system that has something in place that makes it extremely hard to change a record. Globally accessible. Uh, so what I mean by this, if we really are going to have a truly public place to put uh, these records, um, they have to be accessible uh, across borders. We can't have any notion of controlled access uh, to the data. Because if we take away the global accessibility, we lose transparency, and we also lose the benefits of, of the information being you know, shared to people outside of their locales. So that, uh, and then secure. Now that one's going to be interesting because it probably does mean different things to different people. But in this context, what I'm trying to say is secure means when I put data uh, into this system that it's going to, you know, it's going to stay there. You know, so when I expect something to be censorship resistant uh, and I put data into this system that I want it to remain that way despite continuing attacks and actually despite continuing attacks from state actors. So that's what we mean by that. So some big problems to solve. Um, this is a blockchain workshop. So almost of course, I'm going to advocate for uh, using an open blockchain. And you've heard a lot of examples provided at this conference that actually talked about using a permission blockchain or consortium blockchain. So I'm actually not talking about those at this time for, for the, the demonstration that we're going to have here. Uh, I have strong reasons why an open blockchain is actually the preferred way to go. But the bottom line is it's a decentralized ledger that's spread out across a whole bunch of computers around the globe. And by decentralizing that ledger, and when I mean decentralized, I mean that the data is not really controlled by any one computer or any one organization or any one consortium of, of organizations. It just means it has, there is no control about that. What is controlled, though, is that there is a, in order to participate in such a system, one has to follow certain rules, a protocol, and these rules, as you follow them, are going to give you that decentralized nature. So it's, that's what enforces whether something is correct or not. Um, this last point here on proof of existence, I'm going to pause to explain what I mean by this. This is the important characteristic of using an open blockchain as it relates to property rights or records uh, in this case, is that we get this proof of existence with blockchains, and, and uh, there's, um, there's a lot of math, and, and a little bit later, as if people ask uh, me to go into more detail, I certainly can talk more about the cryptography and all of the math behind it. But proof of existence, what I'm talking about here, in a mathematical way, we can prove uh, who wrote a record, when that record was written, and what the contents were in, the, in that record. It's all very important. So that's what I mean by proof of existence. And the reason why we need that, this, is, this kind of goes back to what we were showing earlier uh, with Puerto Rico. Um, 
uh, I didn't actually highlight this, but the story and that of the gentleman that had his picture in the center, um, his grandfather did a handshake agreement with the farmer and came to an agreement to build a house for his family. Now, two generations later, the grandson had this catastrophe hit and he, ha he and his family have been living in that house uh, for, for three generations and they, uh, and they had this problem of proving their ownership which prevented them from getting reconstruction funds to rebuild after Hurricane Maria. So proof of existence would have helped that out if the grandfather actually even though it was an informal agreement if there was something in writing that uh, that could pass as, as you know, demonstrating that ownership was transferred or at least permission to use that, that space was transferred to uh, this man's grandfather. And there was something on there that proved that that document was genuine. Well, we would have the proof of existence. So, so that's why, in broad terms, this is why this characteristic is so important. Can I ask questions? Yes, this is great. I'm just curious about the open blockchain thing, uh, the rational of, and I understand that it, it can be very powerful in a way, but the rational of making it global accessible, if you could talk more on that, and why would you want to do that, and especially uh, from the context of some of the experiments that uh, Medici is involved in, whether it be Wyoming, as you mentioned, or a couple of other countries, like what has been your experience in taking such an approach with those counties, if you are? So, so yeah, that's a good question. So. Uh, the question was, um, you know, what's the experiences for why one would want to uh, make their uh, property records globally accessible in, in the fashion that I'm describing here? The on the, the on on the money side of things, on the business side, uh, the biggest reason for having that global access is that uh, uh, if I were a lender and I wanted to be able to use uh, property right as collateral for funds that I'm going to uh, distribute to uh, uh, distribute to someone who has, has that property right. If I were an international lender, the whole idea is that even though the borders are far away, I would have access to be able to see for myself that those record, records are genuine and um, we'll kind of jump over the issues of identity and all that, but if the record matches up with the individual I'm looking at and I can see this while sitting in New York City, I have the ability to you know, transfer funds and make, make a loan. Or The whole idea is to get capital into to them. So that, that's, an, oh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. You said mathematical formulation. Could you please explain? I will, and let me, uh, let me, kind of finish on, so that that's the first reason and the second the second uh, uh, reason really is I would say it is a way for those on the outside and when I say it outside those beyond the borders of a particular country that they can actually examine records also for themselves and if they do have something that's mathematically proven to show that the records at least that are stored there are really what was purported to be there that, that what you see, then they have some idea of, of how to weigh that documentation as, as evidence you know, for themselves. And so the question about um, mathematical proofs, and, and did you want me to kind of go through what, what they were or what? Right now it's just a word, you said mathematical proofs. How do you translate a picture of a docu document into something more than it is? Oh, that, yeah, and that and that's actually a, a really important point to, to to consider. So, so in the case of a picture, there's like two ways you can um, can, can deal with that. And the, the one is kind of the naive but easy approach is uh, a picture. When you scan it, it really becomes a string of bytes uh, on a disk drive. Okay, it's it's a digital. It becomes a digital representation of that image. And of course, there'll be standards of how that's formatted and, and that gives Adobe and Microsoft and everyone the ability to, to write software that allows you to read it. But when that file is created, that, in a, that content, uh, the, the, the exact order of those bits as they follow each other uh, becomes a digital fingerprint. And how it becomes a digital fingerprint is that in 
cryptographic math, we have cryptographically secure hashing algorithms. And a hashing algorithm uh, kind of has, they, they work this way. They essentially, they accept a number as an input and they generate a, a number that looks like it's random. Like if you were just to look at it from the outside and you see output from this hashing algorithm over and over again, you're just gonna, it will appear random. Like mathematically, it will appear random, meaning they'll have a nice even distribution across uh, the, the, the set of numbers that it's able to produce. However, that hashing algorithm is what we call deterministic. And when we say deterministic, it means uh, every time I put in one input for this picture, so I have a picture, I like, call it my, my cat picture. Uh, you know, the string of bytes that represents my cat, every time that gets put into this hashing algorithm, it will always produce the same number. Although on this end, it looks really random. Now, the mathematical proof isn't exactly what I just described, is that uh, if I have this hashed value, this number that looks random, and then I come along and I, I get something that purports to be the my cat picture that I just had, and I run it through that hashing algorithm again. Because that algorithm is deterministic, meaning the same input should give me the same output, uh, when I compare, what do I do is I run that against the picture that I think is my cat picture. I run the hashing algorithm against it, and I take a look at the number that comes out at the other end, and I compare the two. I compare the one that's my proof, that is the proof, and the test against that proof is, uh, is the thing I just generated. And that's how we get a mathematical proof in this, this sense, we take advantage of that. Um, I, I think there was a question here, so. Um, uh, the whole idea of blockchain and basically the thing of cryptos, as far as I know, is uh, to eradicate the third party, so how, uh, and the whole process is peer to peer, right? So how do you see the role of the registries in that regard? What are they gonna do? Okay. Um, so the question is, uh, um, because uh, blockchain technology, especially Bitcoin, and when people read the Satoshi Nakamoto white white paper that comes with it, it, does, it is a goal to disintermediate, at least in that use case, the banking system from, from payments, uh, for sure. So that, that's an ideal of, of blockchain systems, and that's true here. So the question was, is this idea meant to, I think it's to displace uh, official registries, is, is that the idea? Um, I'm gonna offer yes and no. <laughs> uh, yes, because what I'm gonna show you, and, uh, and then after this session, I won't do it like uh, here, I do have a live demo, I can kind of demonstrate it, but um, if, you, if you build what I have here, you could, you could register stuff on your own if you really want to. Um, and it'll be on the blockchain, and it'll be visible. But remember what was one of the characteristics that I, I, I highlighted as what was important about proof of existence. One of it is proof of who. Who wrote that record? So if Chris comes along, and I actually I think uh, uh, one of my demonstrations that I uh, have is, yeah, Chris is going to come along, and I can, I'll just say, oh, I'll just pretend that I own the World Bank building that we're in, and I'm just going to give it to Bob. <laughs> All right. And I can create a record to, to show that, but here's the kicker. <laughs> the signature, the digital signature, which kind of uses that hashing algorithm method I talked about earlier, it's a little, slightly different. It's in a uh, an form of encryption. But when I sign that, uh, that record, Everyone's gonna know that I signed it. Uh, they may not know, uh, let me qualify that a little bit. They may not know like specifically that I, Chris Chrysostom, wrote that record, but they're gonna know that a person with this uh, key, this public key, wrote that record. And, and if your own personal dictionary or directory of, of addresses, you look at that address and go, I don't know who that is. It won't have any meaning, right? So that record was registered, but it, it may have no meaning at all. So if I were writing an application and I, I saw something was written by 
some party that I have no idea who they are. And, and, and people probably are familiar with the idea of Bitcoin, that you can, anyone can generate an address, you know, collect funds, send funds from it, uh, and you don't know who they are. However, over time, if you look at the patterns, there starts to become a way to, to discover who, who those people are. So the short answer, yes and no. Yes, as in you can go ahead and write things up, but maybe no, because in the case of Teton County, I've been talking about that, they get their own key. And we're going to publish it and make, make it available to everyone to, and let them know that this public key, when you see something written by this, this key, that is the Teton County clerk. And that's how you know. Um, let's see. I had a question over here. That, and then we'll move back. Yeah, and I, I, I think that's an excellent question. So um, some people probably have come in here to probably start picking my brain about what's going on in Teton County because it's been advertised a lot that we've uh, been putting their property records on, on blockchain. So what does that mean? So that's a good example. In reality, we're supplementing what they already have. Um, right now in Teton County, in order to uh, file a warranty deed or something, you actually need to uh, essentially write up some documentation. You do need to go to a notary and get uh, signatures verified, our identities verified. That record does go to the county recorder and then ownership can be demonstrated through this warranty deed uh, after that point. But what's going on there, even the blockchain side of it is Teton County gets that record in, they do their work, with, which right now what they do is they read the document, they abstract it, they store that information in their own database, and then they check off something that they want to send this to the blockchain. So I just take their same data and their document, and we do put that on, on, on blockchain, so there is a proof that they, they recorded that information and then what happens after that is that going forward, um, what I'm thinking is others outside of there are always going to check back and look at that signature and they're going to say, oh, okay, this was written by the Teton County clerk and I know that. So I know that this information is a mirror of what they have in their database. Or they're going to say, I know that they recorded this and this is what they intended to record it. So. I think uh, the bottom line right, right now, we're talking about supplementing those uh, registries because the registries are the ones who actually get the data, they have it. Well, that's why I kind of said yes and no on that. So yeah, I, 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 maybe I can create my own registry and if I go through all the trouble of running around uh, you know, counties in the United States, for example, and collecting all information for myself and start posting things in and maybe I can convince the world that my data is correct, but I'm willing to bet that in reality what's going to happen is that trust won't get built up until uh, something that comes from an authority actually uh, uh, shows it. So, uh, two parts, two questions, pieces of question. First, you, know, you said that Teton has basically their own key, so they effectively are their own registry. Yep. So the value to storing a blockchain is only apparent when it's distributed. So you have to have other people interested in having in also participating in that community, otherwise it's effectively closed. Right? I mean otherwise it's still not distributed. There's no value from a disaster response or, you know, how do you recreate that? So where are you in kind of building up that community interest of interest so others are participating so you actually get the distributed nature? Uh, okay, so that, that is definitely part of the, like the non-technical side of uh, what we're trying to do. And, and you actually have a very good point uh, that, that these records going in is that um, building that community that, uh, that you suggested is, is part of building trust in those records. Now, you talk about who would want to participate. And, uh, we've already had like uh, title insurance companies come and approach us and say, we like this blockchain record idea because 
and, and what they want to see in the case of the United States, they would like to see this all implemented in all 3,300 counties because they're getting tired of, uh, even though a lot of it now is online and digital, apparently it's like, they, it's like a different interface, it's a different way of accessing the same type of information over and over again, 3,300 di different times uh, for the United States. So I guess what I, I'm trying to say is the, the community in the beginning are probably those who are going to be vested into accessing this data uh, on, a, on a global way or, you know, cut across uh, boundaries. To, to uh, answer your question about uh, proving it later on, I, what uh, I'm imagining how the system will evolve is that uh, over time when someone has uh, the certain documents or the, the, the data that represents uh, a warranty deed, for example, uh, we will be able to build some tools that actually will allow you to input that data on one hand, run those hashing algorithms that I mentioned earlier, and compare the proof, what's on the blockchain and, what's, uh, uh, and what yet we have there. So uh, and let me, I'm going to take two more questions and we'll, we'll drive on. So uh, go. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Maybe you're going to, maybe I'm preempting something. So everyone's happy with the owner and um, you've got, uh, say, a, a bank or finance institution involved um, and um, something goes wrong, maybe it's a consumer protection issue and um, it's an asset-backed security, I get that, so you know, some money can go back, but you need to go to court for some reason. And someone, you know, someone's here and, and, and they say the bank, <coughs> Finance institutions on the other side of the world. What, what do you do? What's the th um, so the qu the question I, I think in the nut in the nutshell is when a dispute occur occurs, yeah. how can this data be useful in that situation? Especially if we're talking about jurisdictions that I think and are spread out. Where do you? Um, okay. Report? Well, I'm a technologist, so I might. This, this will sound like I'm, I'm avoiding the, the question, but uh, it's, it's really not. It's also part and parcel with, with uh, the idea here. Um, I, I'm going to propose that what I'm talking about here, having these records on blockchain with the mathematical proofs, and let's say that trust does get built up in it enough that people understand that, okay, when there's a mathematical proof that this record is the way at least... Teton County clerk said it was 10 years ago. In the case of, of a dispute, what I'm hoping is that that becomes uh, strong evidence that someone can bring to a dispute. And then in terms of the adjudication that you're talking about, that one I feel like is almost is outside of the scope of the blockchain and the technology. So what I would hope for, and um, in, a, in the answer that maybe many haven't Hoping I would say is that there's some smart contract out there is going to figure that all out. And actually, I'm not saying that. I'm I'm feeling that's a, that's where people need to be involved. And what I'm proposing is really just having a stronger set of evidence of of what actually happened sometime in the past. So in the case of a dispute, and in the case of let's say the dispute is two claims. Maybe there are two warranty deeds that actually encompass the same uh, plot of land. Uh, what I'm hoping is that one, one other thing that we can do with blockchain, remember I said earlier, we know who wrote the record. And now, if it turns out that Sherry Daigle of Teton County, the Teton County clerk, recorded two warranty deeds for the same property, but with two different sets of grantor grantees, uh, I'm going to argue that that's going to be an issue that Teton County has to deal with uh, uh, and, and resolving that conflict. So the two records will be there on blockchain. We'll see them. But what I'm hoping that it would be that, that there will be a judge that will uh, make a judgment and probably do an official ruling. And that ruling, too, and as it turns out, Teton County, um, they put all of their judgments into their <laughs> into the register too but you one would see that so i would see warranty deed a warranty a deed b maybe some sort of filing of a complaint of the of the conflict and i sure hope that there's going to be a record uh with a ruling from a judge saying okay i've made a decision warranty a doesn't 
isn't valid, but warranty D is. So it becomes evidence, and that's, that's what I'm going for. Uh, actually, I have one more question, I want the... Yeah, I, my questions are based on the follow-up that we had before. Uh, so when you say open, uh, uh, the decentralized, the open block, public blockchain, mm -hmm. are you going to use the, the existing public Ethereum or Bitcoin or something similar like that? Or are you proposing something your own? Well, and, um, uh, oh, go ahead. And the other was, uh, uh, the other question on the follow-up, the existing land systems. You said you kind of do integration and do that. Uh, but then, uh, did you run into any data governance, privacy issues, and how were you able to handle those? Yeah, two really good questions. So, um, the, the first one is, uh, which is the chain <laughs> that we're using, essentially. Um, so in what I'm gonna show here, we're using a Flow blockchain, and actually uh, what we're doing in Teton County right now is also using the Flow blockchain. It is a source code derivative of Bitcoin. Uh, it's very similar, uh, and when we move on to the next uh, slides, I'm gonna kinda show where it, it's a little bit different uh, that allows us to handle uh, land records more nicely. So that's, that's the fast answer for, for that. Um, and actually remind me again of your second question. The, when you said you're, st you're working with the existing system. Privacy. Uh, yeah, privacy. Yeah, so that, that's it. Uh, right now, uh, in the United States, are, um, it's common that county records, like, like what we're working with in Teton County, they're fully public, as in they don't, they don't mind it being out there and seen, because uh, it's, it's, that's the way it is. So, um, I actually do have data there. I think in Europe will be considered uh, private because I, I'm kind of alluded to it before. They have like a warranty deed to sh describe, you know, location and, and, and ownership. And there's always a grantor and grantee, and that typically is a is a name. You'll see first name, surname, first name, surname, or name of a company or something like that in those fields, and that's in the clear. Uh, so they don't. They're not worrying about it. However, they do have a request that uh, we, we have the ability to blacklist uh, records. And what they mean by that is, it's okay if it's on the chain, but when I say I want something blacklisted, I want your software to not display or render uh, those records. Um, and so as an example that was given to us, uh, I, I don't know how widely known this is, but we do have a former vice president who actually has uh, property in uh, Teton County, uh, Wyoming. And, uh, and his family did ask that, that their, their records not be displayed, but what the county clerk there said, however, this is public information. If someone comes into my office and asks explicitly for this record, I have to give it to them, because by law, this is public. But th she's willing to put up a barrier and make things just a more difficult. So we have done something uh, similar. The, the software I'm gonna show actually has built in with a, a, a blacklisting function. I'm, I'm not gonna be able to demonstrate it here in, the, in what we have, but uh, the open source software actually has uh, a blacklisting functionality where even if a record is on the blockchain, we can stop its display uh, bef actually before it reaches the application uh, level. I'll probably talk about that. Um, I, I'm going to drive on to the next parts and uh, let's talk a little, bit, a little bit more about the structure of, uh, well, this kind of gives you an idea of what we did do for Teton County. Um, but I also want to talk about, in general terms, if we were to use open source software to uh, build our own register, this is how it would look. And I'm going to take some time to explain the difference between we've got you know, this gray shaded back, background area and then this light blue background area. This part down here, I have it labeled, uh, open, shared data, and then I have these, you know, three blocks here, an index, blockchain records, decentralized storage. So what I mean by this, this right here is all run by open source software. So the blockchain records. Uh, earlier I mentioned that uh, uh, we're using Flow blockchain, so this is their logo. Um, but 
we also need to have a way to store large files um, in, in this overall system. These large files right now for Teton County, they're scanned documents, PDF files. Uh, however, you know, if it's, once it's digital, we can do, um, you know, uh, any type of, any type of media if you want, audio, uh, audio video, and, and things that come in the future. Uh, so we're using a, a decentralized network that's called uh, IPFS, and the, the initials stand for Interplanetary File System. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, some of the magic I was talking about earlier with the blacklisting to kind of help with uh, some privacy issues, uh, and I'll explain why we have an index here, but this, this layer of software is also open source, and this one is, this is the layer that gives us a lot of easy access to the blockchain. So I want to emphasize this right here, this is open shared data, which I do imagine that the next layer up, there's going to be multiple vendors, multiple applications, sort of either accessing or writing data into this open shared space. But this layer up here, now this is for Teton County, and I will, I will show this off. And on actually, there, there's, there, I have a demonstration too from Rwanda that uh, um, also is an example of this, uh, of a second application that sits up here. Now this layer up here, I'm imagining, it could be open source. So if someone wants to make their own register and roll their own and try to become that authority, um, in terms of the technology, yeah, they could do it. They'll just have to write their own up here. Follow the standard that's enforced by this indexing layer, and then they'll be able to access or they will be able to read, or excuse me, write uh, to the blockchain here. So, uh, so what, the important thing I want to emphasize is this layer up here is where I imagine, because everyone always asks me, where, where do the different applications start making their money? Um, uh, you know, they think of that. Uh, I, I imagine it's happening up here. This is where if you want to des design your own application that requires a subscription, users to come in and, you know, they're doing all the traditional uh, you know, enterprise application type of things, they can, they can do that up here. But what's interesting is that the data down here is actually accessible by everyone. So, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail, and this is where I might generate more questions. So do feel free to slow me down a bit. <laughs> um, what I wanted to talk about here is, I remember I said earlier, uh, Flow blockchain is actually related to Bitcoin, and, but yet there's a slight modification to how Flow blockchain does things compared to what... Um, uh, Bitcoin does. But I'll talk about what's the same. This layer here, uh, this, this green, green rectangles where I call, I have inputs and outputs. Uh, that probably means nothing to you if you don't know how uh, Bitcoin transactions are, 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 uh, are set up. <coughs> but suffice it to say that is, that's what you would see in the Bitcoin side of the world. Inputs means essentially uh, coins that are kind of coming into the transaction and the output is coins going out of the transaction. So it's a transfer. You, we, we, we more or less have a transfer of ownership of, of the coins and I'm talking about the, the, the cryptocurrency that's involved. And that is taking place on this stuff that's represented in green. So that, for those who don't know the structure of uh, Bitcoin and uh, or, or any of their derivatives. Just suffice it to say, it's the, it's the record that shows a transferring of funds from one account to another account. Now one thing that we are able to do is create a payload, and in our case, we can go up to 1,040 bytes, take that payload and attach it to this transaction. And when I say attach it, I mean cryptographically attach it. That when there's a signature for this whole thing, that signature still gives me the, you know, the who and the what and, and, um, and when, all of that. So this all becomes like a big transaction. So we have our, our transfer funds, 
But we also have this extra information, which right now is our records. And I'm going to show, I'm going to show you what uh, it's going to borrow from Teton County. I'm, we'll actually show you what the data looks like. Um, but it is part of the overall transaction. Um, and then, of course, once we create that transaction, uh, I'm just tr uh, we, we put it in onto the blockchain, and it's got to follow all of the rules that normal blockchain processing requires in order to get introduced into a, to a block. So I'm going to slow down a little bit there, make sure in, in the big picture, everyone kind of understands. Yeah, go ahead. In this case, yeah. yes, if you want to, the, the act that I'm showing here is the actual recording. So if you're going to publish to Flow Blockchain, yes, you would, you would have to. Um, All righty. So now I'm, right now I just want to show the software that was involved. And so this green part, <laughs> So in our case, uh, green is one of MLG's colors. So I'm saying, OK, this is probably the part that, was, that can be written specifically for an organization or for your own application. Uh, this part here is the document. Uh, I call it JSON because um, that, that's the formatting structure that we use to, to format the, the data itself. Um, so we just our recorder op application reads it and then drops it into this uh, open source library called JSOIP. And JSOIP is written in JavaScript, if anyone cares. Uh, that means it actually runs on web browsers. And it does run in an environment called Node, Node.js. And so this library then uh, knows how to talk to Flow Blockchain correctly. So it, it talks to Flow Blockchain and actually takes the record and puts it Writes, writes it to the blockchain and handles all of the, uh, you know, waiting around for the consensus and the, on that type of thing uh, to take place. So, so all I wanted to show about this with this graph is give you a feel of where uh, the, the proprietary uh, application could be here. But from this point on, we're, we're on the open source stuff. So. Do we have a what? Do you have a limit on the JSON payload? Uh, for a record, actually, no. Uh, well, I should say, uh, there's always physical <laughs> limitation, but, but we, we have, uh, in practical terms, no, we don't. Uh, one transaction can hold 1,040 bytes. I mentioned that earlier. However, that JSOIP uh, has a mechanism to allow you to span multiple transactions if, you if your one record goes more than 1,040 bytes. So it, it is possible to, uh, to have one record. And actually, in our testing that we've been doing for Teton County, for example, our, uh, our number floats between five and six transactions per single record that they have. So, um, but I, there, there is a real limit. I, th um, I, think, uh, I think we did some testing. And we kind of ran, I did run into problems and when I hit like one, if I had a record that spanned like a thousand transactions, something like that. So, uh, and then, and even that, there was, there was some technical reasons why that happened and I'm going to be fixing those uh, shortly. So, um, so on our level, I, I did want to talk about how the open source software actually works and I'll, I'll walk through a little bit of how the pieces work so you can kind of get an idea. So this one is showing searching and retrieving the data. So records now, let's say they're on the blockchain. They're there. Um, you, anyone who's worked with blockchain are probably going to say, wow, you mean do you search for things starting at the beginning of the blockchain and going all the way to the end? And if I did that, it would be a very slow search. So I will admit that. Uh, starting at the beginning, at block one and going down to, in the case of Flow Blockchain, they're at 3,300,000 right now. Uh, that, that's going to take a long time. So this middle layer that I called the index or the indexer, open index protocol, this actually has software that does that reading the blockchain for me, but it builds an index 
on another piece of open source software called Elasticsearch. And uh, this index does become a database that can be used to search against and retrieve records uh, very quickly. So, so again, the search and view application, th this would be the part that uh, MLG would build or you would build or someone else would build. But this part would be the open source software they would interact with. And to, to locate a record, they just have to pass some search parameters into this indexer and they get the record back. So, all right, okay. I have, oh, I'm assuming this is optional, so I will skip over this, which means I can take, take a question. Yeah, I want you to tune this late, so that you may have addressed this already, but you know, we're working, our organization is working in a lot of places that are like a legitimate titles. And when we talk about blockchain, our concern is that those who got their titles illegitimately, once in the blockchain, then they're, then they're forever. And there's also concern, and I don't know if it's legitimate, that's why I'm asking the question. It's also concern that it also might further existing power dynamics in the community, where if those who got their titles legitimately once they go to the blockchain, when they can't be taken out, that power becomes, you know, stable. So is there anything in here that keeps that from happening? So if I were to repeat the question, I think uh, what I'm here is how, how would one handle or how does this model handle illegitimate titles getting recorded into the system immutably on a blockchain? Uh, and what's what, is there any mechanism to deal with that? And then also, I think you're saying, uh, how does that play out in a society, I guess, where someone may get an Ill illegitimate title onto the system, but then they suddenly have got that power and they get to exercise it. Is yeah, that? Yeah, that's correct. Just to sort of add on to that, we work in a lot of communities where you've got people who have um, you know, multi-generational wealth, and over time they've collected a lot of... I see. And maybe not legitimately. And so, whereas others are saying, no, that was stolen from my grandfather, and they might wave a paper around, the concern is that once it goes in the system, then it becomes beautiful. And, and then, uh, on that score, this, this is, actually, this is how, this would be my personal approach <laughs> for, uh, for building a, a register. Um, so what we're doing for Teton County would not be like that. If someone had that kind of uh, complaint, what probably would get recorded is the complaint that actually would go to the, uh, the Teton County clerk and then a judgment by, by, so it would get adjudicated, they'd have their trial and, and, and then a judge would make a judgment, but that judgment would get recorded. So in the case of that example, the conflicting stuff will be in there, but then the adjudication records will end up uh, into this register too on blockchain. So when you're reading the blockchain, uh, if you're doing the indexer and you have your search parameters, okay, what I am envisioning, you're gonna find all of those records. Now, but that's not quite exactly what you were saying. So what you're suggesting is, is kind of fascinating to me and actually something that, uh, this is where I would purport that it would be cool if one had their own way of registering their own stuff. So let's say, you know that something was acquired illegitimately and you want to raise a dispute about that, um, record it. So what we're talking about in this system, this is an open blockchain, you can go ahead and record it, but I think what, what is gonna be key here to remember is that we're, we're gonna know who recorded it. Uh, again, not exactly the name or some, but because we're gonna have this address that only that who uh, will have a record where a signature can only be generated by an individual who holds the private key uh, to that signature. We we kind of know who did it, and who or who wrote that record. And I I would I would submit in your in your cases maybe it would be interesting if there was a, a a solution or a system that allowed for people to say hey you know what I I have all I have this bit of evidence to show that person A stole this property from my family a hundred years ago and, and I can prove it and maybe they put their records in. Sure, it's gonna be signed by them, but I'm hoping what that would mean is that if there is an external authority that could adjudicate that, that they would have that as evidence, so. I have uh, two questions. <laughs> sorry. No, it's all right. Uh, are there any fees for the transaction? Well, the reason why I'm asking is, 
uh, because we're pretty much making the same thing. We're hashing the metrics from the public register. We'll be, we'll be using uh, the Bitcoin blockchain. So uh, for each transaction. Flow blockchain would definitely be less expensive in US dollars for it to do that. Um, yes, there is a transaction fee. Okay, and the second one is, uh, can you unwind the transaction? We're going back to the you know, illegitimate title or whatever. Uh, meaning, um, as far as I know, there can be a consensus between uh, peers and if some they decide they can unwind a certain transaction. And what will that mean in regard to the uh, registration of uh, records? So the second question, can we un unwind transactions? So on the protocol level, no. Once, once we get things confirmed onto the blockchain, uh, that transaction is locked in there. However, what one can do is exactly what I just described about how Teton County would handle uh, a dispute of like two warranty deeds connecting to the same location or same uh, plat. Uh, some way, shape, or form, they will have to record adjusting transactions, if you were, or records that will override what was there previously. So the way I liken it is uh, I used to do a lot of bookkeeping for a nonprofit organization and at the end of the month I actually had this date where I told everyone uh, once I do my reconciliation for all, all of the accounts, I'm done. I've closed the books. I am not going to make changes even if there's a mi mistake. But what I did say is but what you can do is in the following period you can create a new transaction that has that corrects for something in the back. So that's uh, you know, that, that would be how we handle that. So I can't unwind the transaction, but we're dealing with records, uh, uh, land records. So what I would s suggest is that there be another record that maybe would supersede uh, a previous one. So in the back. Um, sort of follow up that, since uh, I guess Bitcoin is sort of the main chain, the biggest one, how do you ensure that flow coin sort of keeps running? price tank to zero and no one's going to mine it. If you start mining it, it's more like centralized and you try to pump it you get yeah. investigated by the SEC. Yeah. <laughs> no, that, that's actually uh, a good point and, and um, to be honest, that's, that's, a, that's a danger that, that these all the applications, depending on it, have to uh, deal with. However, I would say, but um, I would also say that, that any business actually has to uh, grapple with that issue of incentives and how do I keep the development of my product going sustain while I need to be continuously selling. In the case of Flow Blockchain and also the open source uh, layer software, this open index protocol, part of its protocol is, um, now this is optional right now, but when one publishes uh, or writes records through the blockchain, the, the protocol allows for the one doing the publishing to add a substantially larger transaction fee to be used as kind of a publisher fee. So like if MLG, if I wanted to, if I say, oh, I'm going to charge a one cent, or uh, let's make it even cheaper, uh, I'll do, we can do 10 records per penny uh, publishing fee. I would take that amount of flow and add that as a transaction fee to, uh, to, the whole, to that publishing process. And then of course what I'm hoping this will equate to is over time as we start getting velocity of transactions occurring because more and more records are getting put into the system, then we will start creating that incentive for, uh, uh, for flow blockchain to, to get mined even more. Uh, so that, that, that's the short answer is that we want to build in an incentive for the miners to keep it going, and sus sus sustainability is an important part of that. Got the I just wanted to ask, um, we, we heard the other day um, about the, the system in Dubai that is operational. Mm -hmm. um, um, how does your system compare to theirs, and, um, well, is it the same, the same thing? Could you, could you uh, it, it is not the same thing. I, I, I would say in terms of what they do, they definitely are further along than what we're doing because uh, we're, we're actually doing something slightly different. Um, I, I would argue uh, Dubai, what they were dem showing you, is actually trying to use blockchain as, as a smart workflow system is what they're trying. So they are actually baking in their tra the transactions that take place on their system, they actually bake that into the Hyperledger blockchain that they're, they're, they're using. And 
I, I believe one reason why they had to go the route of using essentially a, a consortium blockchain is that uh, they wanted to get a higher performance to allow them to, to be hitting the system with a far greater number of transactions uh, than what we're talking about here. So, um, actually, they probably could talk to us if they wanted to because it's open source software that would be able to uh, get access to the data. So, yeah, if they're willing to play by the rules and, 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 and communicate with this open system or this idea, yeah, they, they would be able to access Teton County's uh, records if they really wanted to. Uh, I may not be able to go the other way around and from the outside just get into their system. So. Um, uh, you know, I would argue that kind of reduces the, the, uh, the idea of transparency and, of course, global accessibility. However, I think that's part of their use case. That's, that's what they want to, to, to control. Um, one more question, and I do want to show some demos to kind of give you guys an idea of what I'm talking about here. Well, just a comment on that and then a question. I mean, probably, I mean, the JSON records can be different between your two systems, so they would just have to interpret, you know, have a parser for your they, they could. Yes. That's actually correct. So my, my question is, you know, the transaction is supposed to be immutable. Mm -hmm. But there's, you know, lots of stories and in, in events where either registries have been hijacked and they've lost records of transa transaction records or they've been hit by spoofing. So how, how, are you, how do you deal with, with that? I mean, from a start with a registry perspective. Well, I mean, how do you prevent the registry from, you know, I'm not, I'm not familiar with enough, but I just, I've read about it so that, you know, parts of the registry just go away based on some type of, uh, you know, half attack. We're talking about 1% about That's, and, and I even think that maybe that is, what you're really asking. So if you're asking about a 51% actually erasing record, so really quickly with full blockchain, that is gonna be pretty close to impossible at this point. Yes, full blockchain did have a 51% a, a attack last summer and the developers quickly implemented uh, a, a no long reorganization uh, protocol that actually is gonna prevent that same type of attack happening again and the attack by the way, it was uh, a chain was mined in secret that got about 180 blocks ahead of where the rest of the uh, network was uh, was at, and they they erased a single transaction, and it was a transaction that essentially ripped off uh, an exchange called Bitrix. Um, they, so they they did uh, they used their hashing power to uh, uh, put in place this other. Uh, chain that did not have that transaction. That transaction disappeared, uh, but it wasn't so far back that it impacted any of the, the records that were stored safely in, in flow data. Um, this is what kind of happens and, uh, on that, is that uh, as more blocks get, get mined and get added onto the blockchain, the records that were stored in the past, and I'm actually only saying within a few days, <laughs> uh, the, the amount of work required to go backward and delete that data uh, it becomes extremely large, even if you're paying for uh, renting hashing power in, in the example that uh, you, you gave there, the 51% attack. And now with this new protocol change that Flow Blockchain has, has implemented, um, they actually will restrict if, if someone tries to drop a a new chain that's a hundred blocks ahead of where the previous one is or with, with more uh, work against it, it, the protocol is going to reject that. So it's only, they, they only have that hundred blocks. And in the case of full blockchain, one block occurs every 40 seconds. And, and so, you know, they, they only have up to those hundred blocks to be able to mess around with the data. Typically, when a record gets dropped into uh, Flow Blockchain, you, you, it's, it, it's dropped in there, and when you need it, it's, 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 it's greater than just a few days later. So by the time you're talking a record be, being in place for a week or for a month, the, the amount of work uh, that would have to be expended would be too prohibitive to, to, to write that out. 
Um, did that answer your question though about what, okay, go one more there and. Um, going back to the idea of um, land disputes, um, how, is, how does the system handle disputes that normally don't go to court? So say um, a, uh, a clerk in Canada illegitimately registers land in Minnesota and a clerk in Minnesota legitimately registers land in Minnesota. In, in a normal land registry system, no one would even know that happened and no one would really care. Um, it would probably get removed from the Canadian system after it's noticed, but it would never go to the court. And mm -hmm. you can have those complaints and then judge ruling records on the blockchain. But if I am naively looking at the blockchain looking for records, I just see one clerk registered land in Minnesota, another clerk registered land in Minnesota, and they're in conflict. I wouldn't know any more of that because that's not something that would normally go. Okay, so, um, so right now our, our system and the applications we built don't handle that explicitly, but what I would build into, and it's, so, um, and, and you know, maybe I'm gonna kill two birds when I'm gonna run the, this, this is a side-by-side -side comparison with Teton County on the right-hand side and the application that MLG uh, developed on the left. I'll just kind of let you watch it while I try to answer uh, this question at the same time. The, uh, uh, I would build a system that actually would pay attention to uh, uh, the signature of who, who wrote that. And, and a whole bunch over time, and I was talking about how we expect that the, the layer that's going to be making money for businesses is that application layer th uh, that does the search and the, and the presentation and showing the record. But some other things they could do is also do things like validate data as you're suggesting or run some sort of analysis to kind of make judgments to what uh, uh, to make judgments as to what is you know proper for Teton County so I would probably say in this application things that were written by uh, a key that I didn't recognize I would probably just ignore it is what would what happen um, so that actually can happen now, getting to some of the details of the, the data and the records, um, one thing that we do, we, we do put in a namespace. And this namespace just becomes like a, a, a way for us to uniquely identify what set of data we're, we're talking about. So uh, in the example I have with Wyoming, so today we have something for Teton County, a namespace for that, but uh, Cook County later on may want to add on we're going to use the same software, but the data, I'm, I'm going to be able to flag it uh, with, to, to let us know what, what system it came from. But more importantly, in terms of the proofs, it, it's the, the signature uh, that, that would be looking at. And that, that would be one way I would be filtering things where that were unrelated and not, not important. Some other tricks that we can do too is um, when we get to the idea of, like, say, attestations and all that, if we allow uh, attestations to get attached to records, then we can kind of use uh, actual uh, that deep data analysis of trying to figure out or put, put weights of validity even on on the records that we have. But that would all be relying on the application and so that would be in my mind that might be the the thing that someone would pay for uh, to have a, a slick looking application that provide it all of those type of services of kind of removing the junk, so to speak. So I, I think that was most of what you were talking about, right? So, so if someone does want to interface with your blockchain, they would have to know that some validation may need to occur. They, they would, and so what they would, uh, so when they, when they interface for with this data, uh, they will they will have to pay attention to the namespace that the data is. Uh, apply to. So if it's their own, they'll know, oh, okay, the formatting is going to mean this way, and, and I'll render things uh, accordingly. On uh, that demo, I, I, just, I just wanted to show the stuff on the left-hand side. That, was, uh, uh, that actually was developed in about uh, uh, two months. We actually loaded 180,000 uh, uh, records uh, from Teton County onto uh, a testnet uh, blockchain uh, so that we could uh, kind of test out and see how that, that works. But the development work was, was really quick. And it did come about because we were using open source software that, to make that possible. Um, I did want to show this real quick because uh, 
this is, oh, okay. Um, this is the have my own register uh, idea. So this, this one actually is going to show uh, 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 creating a warranty deed for Peace Coliseum, which is where uh, MLG's headquarters is located. It's actually an, a building owned by Overstock.com. So, um, whoops, let's see. All right. Hey. There it is. So I just want to show really quick what, uh, what I'm. I think this one will give me a chance to talk about what you actually see on the blockchain, real quick. So as you can see, we're just using a mapping application to draw some boundaries. Uh, the point of this exercise is just to show that um, it's not just abstracted data that we can get, you know, like a legal description for a plat, uh, which is what in Teton County, uh, if I had talked through that one, I, I would have shown that there was a, a state parcel identifier that was being used to identify a location. But in this case, we're, we're, we're going to draw a map, and, uh, and there's going to be coordinates for this map, this polygon that gets created and put on the chain. So here I'm just trying to show, yeah, we do have some parcel identifier, legal description that we can put in there. And I have a grantor and grantee. Uh, okay, I guess the joke here is Patrick Byrne is the CEO of Oversock.com and chairman of MLG also. Ali uh, here is uh, actually the CEO of Medici Land Governance. So it's just saying that the grantor is Patrick Byrne, grantee is Ali. Um, here we just want to demonstrate, yes, we can upload files into uh, the system. And uh, there's some categorizations that we use to help us know, you know what, what the file is, is uh, being used for. And I think in a moment we're going to click on the uh, Publish to Blockchain button. And uh, we'll kind of... So right now, it's actually writing the transactions. It's broadcasting them to the network, and it was waiting for its first confirmation. Uh, it was waiting for the, the transactions to get accepted into the mempool of, uh, of the blockchain. And uh, when the user here actually, uh, let's see, scroll down, please. <laughs> It's down this part. Yeah, you can see the transaction IDs. Uh, this is kind of a better view of all the different transactions that were involved in that. And I want to pause this here. This is a really. Um, I'm not good at zooming in, so if, I'll, but I'll pause here so those who want to get closer you can look. But right here, this thing that's called flow data. That is that's our record for. Um, uh, for this transaction. So here we're actually showing, um, let me look real quick, uh, grantor, okay. So this is the grantor, this is the record for the grantor, uh, Patrick Byrne. And, uh, and I'm gonna, when I progress, you'll see that uh, the, the data did get, the record did get split up into multiple transactions. <coughs> and that's, uh, we're clicking on this, we just want to show you that yes, an image was uploaded to a decentralized storage, IPFS. That's what I was demonstrating there. Um, this one is the, the record that represents Ali. So again, this is the JSON that was put into the blockchain. And the thing that's interesting, every time you saw that uh, application that was called FlowSite, FlowSite is developed externally from MLG. This is, uh, again, open source software. Um, it's viewing uh, the testnet blockchain in, uh, in this case. And so that data you know, is public and accessible externally from us. So we didn't have anything to do with that software. So the, the whole idea is if I were to audit anything, you know, I, I have the means to, on my own, access uh, uh, this data. So, and I think we're going to go do the next thing. Um, I did want to briefly talk about this. Um, uh, many have probably talked about our work in Rwanda, and 
In a nutshell, we are, we've been tasked to implement a land transfer uh, operation and we want the transaction to be captured on blockchain. So we're doing something very similar. Um, yeah, and no, I sorry. I had a developer screen capture, and this is, it might be his joke on me. <laughs> so, okay, this is the, the, pr the pretty interface or the prettifying interface showing users collecting their parcel. In a moment, they're gonna fill out information related to uh, what I guess we would consider a purchase agreement. You know, we're gonna have identifying IDs numbers put in place for like the buyer, uh, the seller information was already entered earlier. So what's happening is we're creating a record that represents, uh, I guess an offer, an offer to sell. <laughs> and this offer, uh, oh yeah, right here, they just want to show that they do have a way of collecting payment for a, a fee, but that's kind of outside of the blockchain stuff. But here is what's interesting. You can see there's big button, sign my transfer. So this is the seller. The seller is now uh, doing a signature. Now, I'm gonna pause here for a moment. This, this is a desktop application. Yeah, it's all blank right now because the developer didn't fill it out. But what's interesting about this is he's using a private key that was generated on his desktop system and it's using the Rwanda PKI, so they, he, um, they essentially generated the private key themselves, but they are required to uh, register their uh, public key certificate, and so that there is identity is associated to that. So this means anything signed by this desktop applica application, we know, we know who signed it. Now in the case of what's going on here, that seller purchase or I should say a sale offer, an offer to sell at a certain price to a particular buyer. Um, signing it is going to represent acknowledging that they agree with all the information there that it's correct and they're making an offer. So I'm gonna continue this uh, and, oh. Is that a person or a computer that's signing it? What's that? Is that a person who's signing it or a computer? Person is pushing the button but the computer is actually uh, running all the software to, to do the signature, uh, the mathematically create the signature. It's pretty much the information that we saw collected there, uh, we, it's, it's put into a, a file that we call like a pre-image, which means that it's a, it's a format, it's specifically formatted um, data where we know what the fields are as we put it in, and then we run that hashing algorithm or the signature algorithm against it. Is it so. pretty much like an electronic signature? Yeah, this is gonna be an electronic signature. That's, that's all it's, um, and let me run this. We're gonna hop into some ugly code, but the reason why I want to show that this is, uh, and this is, what, this is what's related to uh, Flow Blockchain, this ugly stuff right here, this is what gets put on as a record onto, uh, no, I guess, onto their register type uh, software. They're going to record this on Flow Blockchain using the same JSOIP uh, intermediary uh, open source software. I just want to point out that the signature is this very large number right here. And that is this piece of information here is the record that proves that the seller really is, um, is that, yeah, the seller is really offering to a buyer to sell their property for that, that price. Um, I'm going to continue this demo and what is fascinating about this is, uh, okay, the developer here wanted to show me, he's copying the transaction ID, he's going to open it up in the, in, uh, the flow site. Explorer uh, just to show, but what we're going to hop to in a moment is we're going we're to get a view as to what the buyer is going to get. The buyer is going to receive an email address or email at, at his email address and when the, uh, when, the, when, when the buyer receives that, the buyer has the ability then to sign this document 
to demonstrate that they agree with the terms of that offer. And right now the dev is just trying to show me, yeah, here's the record, this is what it looks like on the blockchain, uh, format it to look a little more, more nicely, but it's still JSON. Uh, as you can see, there's the signature. That's definitely the biggest part. So, um, so I'll let this run, but we are down to the last five minutes. So I'll probably entertain uh, uh, other questions. You can kind of watch how this plays out and think of anything you want to ask me. So there's one question in the back. Yeah, so I know this is just a proof of concept, but I noticed that in the payment types, cryptocurrency was not on the list. That's so correct. Bank, credit card, and something else. Is that... Uh, in this project, yes, it is. And if you're going to ask, how does our system really know that that payment uh, it, it happens? Hey, we have to rely on an oracle. The, um, the organizations that we we're working with, they just required us to say, you, you hit my API and ask me if this payment took place, and I'm going to tell you whether it took place, and you have to, so. <laughs> so that's, uh, but uh, that's a good question. Uh, I'd love to introduce that idea, so <laughs> maybe uh, maybe next go around I'll bring it up. I'll say it came up at the conference. Well, okay, so this is just kind of showing the rest of it. I, I do want to very quickly. Um, uh, kind of, all right. The, actually, I'm going to skip over that. Um, I do have some other parts of the this. Um, presentation, but uh, what I really wanted to leave you all of you with, I do, on my file that's uploaded on uh, into the conferencing, I do have a bunch of resources. Additional questions, feel free to contact me at my email address, Twitter, Telegram. Uh, if you want my WhatsApp phone number, send me an email. I'll, uh, I'm happy to chat with people, uh, WhatsApp or whatever. It's on the conference one. You may not have, uh, there, it, it's a little bit stripped down. I think some of the video uh, that, that's here uh, is not uh, available uh, on that version, but this page definitely is. And if you want to get a recording of this, I've been recording uh, this session, uh, you're welcome to send me an email and I will be sure to get a link to you. Um, MLG now has a YouTube channel, so I'm allowed to say that, right? <laughs> so we have a YouTube channel, so I, I have a feeling this presentation is going to uh, end up there too. So, any anything else? I have a question. Quick question. Uh, so in the beginning, you mentioned about uh, one of the rationale of going doing open public blockchains is that how can you make uh, these assets liquid for uh, uh, the for the people who are holding them, right? In a way. Uh, it's providing access to capital, which was locked down because of not having a proven sort of uh, way to say that this capital or land belong to me, whatever the property is. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm talking more specifically in the developing country context. Uh, uh, that are you also thinking about like tokenizing those land rights? Uh, and that is something. I, uh, you know what? Hit me up uh, uh, privately. Okay. I, th this slide here. I want to talk about the future, and yeah, I, I actually have, all right, we, we have an idea for the tokenization part. Uh, really fast, unfortunately, tokenization requires this side of things. These records have to be trusted. I have to, they, they, they have to have meaning. Um, tokenization, I, uh, th this uh, funny looking bird here, this is a coin called Ravencoin. You can, you can create digital assets with it, but, and we can link uh, the OIP stuff. Uh, to the asset, but it won't mean anything until I, I, we have trust over here in the repository. Yeah, but I was just, what, I, what I wanted to know was like, what is the value uh, of tokenizing uh, land rights? Or if, if oh, in general, what's the value? Yeah. I, I, no, this is very interesting as well, but in general, like, what would be the value in the case of uh, like property rights? Because I see that that conversation does not take place, and maybe for good reasons in the developing country context, but more so in the 
Uh, so Western countries, that's where it's been happening more. So. Yeah, and that's a, uh, in the developing country, I, I really fast. I, I, I think it can be a way to bring in more capital from like more sources. It's, uh, uh, so when you can fractionalize ownership, that starts to play out. Uh, also, there's all kinds of different rights, not just ownership involved. So you know, people frequently talk about like mineral rights. So, so it, it may be possible that someone who has control over uh, uh, a, a mineral right that they might be able to, to rent it out to to some other party and, and a digital token to do that would make it possible for a online digital marketplace to do that. Uh, but again, okay. I, I feel like that's going to be meaningless until the backing evidence to that token actually has, has some meat. So one more minute. <laughs> Oh, how, how from, well, you, sir, follow my Twitter account, <laughs> and I'll um, Let's see, like I said, YouTube has uh, uh, a channel for MLG, and, um, and actually, oddly, pay attention to Overstock.com's press releases. That is probably the most reliable way to find out our, our announcements for public things. Uh, but if you were to follow me on Twitter, you're, you're going you're gonna to hear periodically, you know, some little things that are happening yeah. along the way. And I, I, may, I may ask uh, our company to maybe do their own Twitter channel or something. <laughs> are you using tokenism as a positive term or in a critical way? Uh, what I, about the downsides? It, here, I'm actually tr trying to be neutral about it. Uh, I, Overall, I think it will be positive, but in the future. Um, so, mostly positive as well. I, I think when we get to that, if we get to that point, that means that the records that we have in the that they are trusted, that there's some critical mass of uh, authorities and individuals even who who believe it, to believe what's there, that uh, that the repository, that the records have grown in enough durability that that people want to use it and want to trust it and then tokenization I think can be will overall be positive but yeah I'm sure it's gonna have some negative consequences too that we can watch so well okay thank you everyone I appreciate your time especially on the last session of the hey, I, I'm welcome as I'm to answer more questions uh, kind of offline and we'll kind of get out of here and let the uh, World Bank staff uh, go home <laughs> and all that. Uh, but yeah, please feel free to hit me up uh, for more questions and I'll be happy to, to answer them. <laughs>